Wednesday evening. It's good to see you tonight. Hope you had a wonderful day. If you will, take a hymnal and stand with us and turn to page number 106. Page number 106. Praise Him, praise Him. Praise Him, praise Him. Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, sing oh earth His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him, highest our King. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Heavenly portals, cloud with Hosanna's ring. Jesus, Savior, reign forever and ever. Crown Him, crown Him, prophet and priest and king. Christ is coming over the world victorious. Power and glory unto the Lord belong. Praise Him. Amen. Well, good to see you here tonight. Glad to, uh, glad to be back. I appreciate you praying for Terry and I. We had a great week. We were able to slip away to Williamsburg, Virginia, and um, we had a good time of fellowship together and got to see some of our, our country's history, and I always enjoy that. I was kidding Terry because she is an observation person. She likes to see things, and I like to read, and so um, I kind of hold her down, and she kind of pushes me along, so it's always fun. But we had a great time together, but we serviced our church family. We were able to visit a church there in Williamsburg on Sunday. And um, just, just to brag on our church, I, it was a good church. We had a good message and everything. But we sat there with 150 people probably and had three people come up to us and greet us. Um, I had no idea who the pastor was until the service started. Um, and, I, and Terry said, she said, I am so thankful for our church family. She said, because they make everybody feel welcome. We just felt like we were, you know, we were a sideshow or something. Um, but I, I want to encourage you. When you see, when you see folks visiting, um, and I think it's good. I think it's good for you. When you go on vacation, first of all, I think you ought to go to church. I think Sundays you ought to be in church. But it's also good. I like going to churches because I like to see what other churches are doing, you know. And so I try to pick up something good and, and then watch for where we have strengths. And, and one of the things we noticed Sunday was just, we have a welcoming church family, and I'm thankful for it, and I want to encourage you in that, but we're sure glad to be home. Let me give you a couple of announcements for the weekend. Um, Friday night, well, let's start with Friday after or Friday morning, 11 o'clock. Those of you going to the Amazing Grazing Fellowship at Circle S there in Morristown at 11 o'clock this coming, oh, that's not this Friday, is it? That's a week, no, forget everything I just said. <laughs> let's start with Friday night. Ladies, Galentine Fellowship this Friday evening. There's some, there's some little cutouts, ladies, back here on the welcome desk. If you want to get one of those, it's, I think it's at 630. Um, but that's for all of our ladies. I want to encourage you to come. Um, you don't get to know people very well sitting in a church service for an hour, hour and a half. You'll get to know them at the fellowships. And so uh, if you can come Friday night to that ladies' Galentine Fellowship, I know you'll have a good time. Hearts and Hands are meeting this coming Saturday from 9 till noon. And then our deacons and officers meet uh, this coming Sunday at 4 in the afternoon. So please uh, make note of those things if you would. Uh, we have several prayer requests to go over tonight. Um, and so we're, we're, I'll try to move things along here so that we can, uh, we can make sure that you're aware of the needs of our church family. Some folks going uh, through some tough times right now, and we'll, we'll make sure you get that. But I am glad to see you. I'm glad you chose to come tonight. We're back in Habakkuk. Um, we're in our, well, it's our second study that we're looking at on standing our watch and uh, how Habakkuk replied to God's answer. You remember Habakkuk said, uh, how long am I going to cry out about this, God, and you're not going to answer? And then God does answer. And here a couple weeks ago, we started looking at Habakkuk's reply 
to God's answer to him. And we'll finish that up tonight, the last part of chapter 1, and the very first verse of chapter 2. So when we shake hands here in a moment, it'll be, it'll be important for you to grab a worksheet for that. And also, please get a prayer bulletin so you can stay abreast of the prayer needs that are in uh, our uh, in our church family. Both of those things are available at the welcome desk when we stand to greet one another in a minute. Maybe you can slip out and grab those if you haven't already. All right. Good to see you tonight, church family. Let's stand. Brother Jeff's going to come back and he's going to lead us in another song together. Okay. Page number 349. Trust and obey. Page number 349. When we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still and with all who will trust and obey. Trust and Take just a moment, great summer. We'll be right back in just a moment. sing together on that last verse. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at his feet, or we'll walk by his side in the way. What he says we will do, where he sends we will go, never fear, only trust and obey. Trust and I was supposed to make one more announcement, um, and this is for our ladies, If, uh, well, some of you men, if you're cooks or bakers. Um, my wife needs to collect some things. We're making some plans for our global focus that comes up at the end of February, um, and she needs some large wooden, I'm going to say cutting boards. I watched the service Sunday, and Daniel struggled too, so I don't feel bad. Um, charcuterie. Um, she said, please put your name on the bottom of them, because um, if not, we're just going to donate them to church. Uh, but we've got a special fellowship plan. We have a special global focus this year. Um, let me just pause, and I, I have to be careful and watch our time tonight. Um, as Ascending Church, uh, we, have, um, we have the privilege this year of having a commissioning service for Amber um, and we're going to wrap up our global focus on the Sunday night with a commissioning service where, uh, you know, missionaries are not sent out by missions boards. They're sent out by local churches. 
And so this is our church sending uh, on that Sunday night. This is our church officially laying our hands on Amber and sending her out as a, as a missionary from Faith Baptist Church. That's going to be the Sunday night service of our uh, global focus. And uh, we're looking forward to that. We're going to have a big fellowship afterwards. And so these things that Terry is looking for uh, are related to that. But she needs those by the 18th so we can kind of be making some plans on that. So February 18th, ladies or gentlemen, if you can help us out uh, with those things, that would, be, that would be very much appreciated. We'll have some more details regarding the global focus coming up uh, this year. I want to, um, I was talking to someone, and I want to this year focus really on the nuts and bolts of how our church is involved in faith promise missions and the global evangelization of the world. Um, we've had several people come into our church that maybe they're wondering, um, what is our relationship with bio uh, and all these missions boards that we, we do? Um, how, how do we, how do we um, uh, send missionaries out? How do we hook up with missionaries? What does the support do? And, and so this year, I, I'd like this year to be a focus of educating our church because the more you and I know how God's word says to get the word out, the better we're going to be or the more apt we're going to be to be involved in it. Um, and so pray about that, but most of all, plan on coming. It's going to start the last Wednesday night of February, and it goes through Sunday. We've got some things planned that I think will be an encouragement to you. If you have your prayer bulletin tonight, I mentioned there are several things that uh, we need to update in here. Of course, we have these several names who are uh, people who are unsaved, and we want to continue to pray for them. Um, some of these are very close relatives to church members. Others are friends. All of them need the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And some we've been praying for for just maybe two months or so. Others we've been praying for for a long time. And so please lift these names up to the Lord as you have time. And you come up with a way that you do that. Maybe it's not every morning or evening that you read all of these names. But you come up with a way that you can pray for these folks and lift them up to the Lord in that, second, in that second column, we have those who are in our church and related to our church who are dealing with different types of cancers. And I, uh, you learned last week about Brother Tom Davis uh, dealing with liver cancer. That's a brand new diagnosis. It kind of caught them off guard. And so please be in prayer for them as they are in the very beginning stages of his, um, not just his diagnosis, but also how they're going to attack. And so pray for them. They had an initial meeting last week at Vanderbilt. Um, my wife talked to Jeanette today. Jeanette's moving back to her home today, and she's coming along. Thankful to hear that. Still covetous of our prayers. And so let's, be, uh, let's keep them in prayers, all of these folks. It's good to see Bill and, and Jill Beck here tonight. Uh, continue lifting up Brother Bill. They're going to be baptized Sunday morning, and we praise the Lord for that. Um, but it, it's good to see both of you here. And we've been praying for you, Bill, uh, regularly. And glad to see God has enabled you to be with us. Said he has 12 radiation treatments left. Uh, and so they're counting down to days. And uh, rate, chemo's done and radiation's almost done. So pray for all of these folks, if you would. There's so many of them on there uh, dealing with cancer. And then uh, those with physical and other needs. Several of these have been, uh, they've been on here for a while and still dealing with some things. We've added some updates here, though. Uh, some of you remember Ken and Louise Regal that used to go to our church. They moved back north. After seeing that weather forecast for the next few days, I don't know why anybody wants to move back north of here, but they did. I, I think they're up in Pennsylvania. Does that sound right? Um, Brother Ken had a pretty severe stroke, and um, he's having a tough time. And so pray for him and Louise. Um, Louise, we learned a while ago that she had Alzheimer's, and I appreciate the cars uh, staying in touch with them and letting us know. Also, Brother uh, Wayne is asking us to pray for Perry Pearson. Um, Perry's had, I believe, eight strokes, and now he's dealing with COVID and double pneumonia. Um, so please be in prayer for them. Brother John's mother, Mary Yingling, is going to be having a pacemaker put in tomorrow. Please pray for Mrs. Yingling, uh, that God would help her to rest well tonight, and then that all of this would go well, um, all of this would go well tomorrow, uh, too. Bella Thompson is, uh, you know, the young lady, she is uh, Jim and Lisa's granddaughter that sings with them sometimes. Bella caught COVID, that COVID's been kind of 
makes in its rounds in their family, and she got that, so please pray for her. Uh, please pray for Brother Chris Woodley, if you would. Brother Chris had a pretty severe stroke. Uh, John or, or Terry or somebody, is there any change? Um, did he regain consciousness? He did? Okay. Um, Chris and his wife Carol down in the Atlanta area, uh, they certainly need our prayers. Uh, his heart issues were one of the reasons they had to come off the field from the Philippines. We partnered with them uh, the whole time they were in the Philippines. And I miss Chris and Carol. Please pray for him if you would. Um, and then right below that is Lois Howard. And she, Lois is the, uh, she's the mother of Linda Williams. And she fell a while back and broke her ankle and uh, also deals with dementia. So pray for her. Agnes Sexton is Suzanne's mom, and um, she sure needs our prayers. In addition to her own health issues, you know, she lost her husband last week. Uh, Brother Sib went home to be with the Lord, so pray for, uh, pray for them. And all of these folks uh, that are on here, if you'd keep them in prayer. Um, we also learned today, Terry Rogers called, and in, in under the recovering from surgery, um, Gary's mom, Helen, had to have surgery today to deal with uh, kidney stones. Um, she had to be taken to the hospital for that. So please pray for, uh, please pray for her, if you would, as well as all of these other folks. I did talk to Brother Ed Emmert today. You notice him under recovering from surgery. Um, he had a pretty extensive surgery. I, I think he said they put ten screws and a rod in his back um, to take care of some problems. And uh, since that's been healing, and it is coming along as far as healing, but he, now he's developed a problem in his left hip and middle. Uh, the middle of his lower back. And so they're going to attempt a nerve block. Uh, they're trying to work out a schedule to get a nerve block to just stop that pain. If that works, they're going to do a nerve burn. Um, and they're hoping that'll work. He said, I can't, he said, I just can't stand for more than two or three minutes. And, um, uh, and he said, if I stand for more than two or three minutes, he said, it, it just, the pain just is excruciating. And so I'd like you to continue to pray for Brother Ed and Cheryl. He said that Cheryl has been a fantastic nurse for him and making sure that he behaves himself as far as not doing too much. Back surgery is pretty uh, aggressive. His was. But I, I wish you'd pray for, for Ed uh, and Cheryl. I, this has to be a bit of a setback for them as far as discouragement goes because um, they were expecting this to be better. And now this other problem with his back has developed. But I know they will appreciate you praying for them. Um, we have two of our homebound Church folks listed there, Faye and Louise, please, con please continue praying for them. Um, and then we learned this afternoon as well that um, Jim Smitherman's brother passed away today, and we think that was rather unexpected. They are, um, if they're not there already, they're on their way to Alabama. And so pray, please pray for the Bobby Smitherman family and continue praying for Suzanne's family, the uh, Sib Sexton family. Um, and I know they'll appreciate that. I want you to continue praying for our brother Joe and his sons and uh, just pray that God would continue to heal their hearts as they continue to adjust uh, with Lori being in heaven. We have our military personnel listed there. Uh, there at the very top is Dustin Davis. Uh, this is Wayne and Vicki's son-in-law. Their daughter, uh, Shelly, is going to be having surgery on the 15th of September, or excuse me, of February, if you'd be praying for, uh, for Shelly, she sure has had a rough time lately, and she's going to be having surgery on the 15th of February, and so please keep her in prayer, and Dustin as they're over in Germany, and all of these folks that are, uh, that are listed here, serving here and around, uh, around the world. On the back, um, we have our missionaries listed there on the back, um, of course, the Childers, and the Yinglings serving the Lord in the bio office, um, Johannes and Kittist serving the Lord in um, Zambia. Uh, the barrels for our shipment was, were delivered yesterday. Um, they smell like Worcestershire sauce. I, I don't know how I'll say it. We have them in a room back there, and Sheila warned me before we went in that room. She said, no, here's their odor. And I open that room up, and they do. Uh, so Daniel's going to work on that this weekend with some water and bleach. Um, I, I can't imagine all that stuff getting to, can't imagine all that stuff getting over Zambia, you know, because um, there, there's a lot of chocolate in there. We don't want it smelling like steak sauce. And so, um, but I'm thankful here. We're, we're working on getting that shipped. My biggest thing on that back page is I'd like you to notice a huge answer to prayer 
and that is regarding Amber Yingling. Uh, we have been praying that God would open the door because her tickets were purchased for March the 1st. And uh, we've been praying that God would open that door. And the praise is this, that the door of the Philippines is open February 10th, visa-free if fully vaccinated. Um, and so Amber has started the vaccination process. And I talked with her about that. And she said, I know, and I, I appreciated her heart in this. She said, I know that God has called me to the Philippines. And if this is what I do to get to the Philippines where God's called me, then this is what I do. And I said, well, amen. Um, and that's a, that's a perfect way to look at that. Because of that process, she's moved her date to the 21st of March. And she texted me today and said all those, those things have been arranged. So she'll be flying out on the 21st of March instead of the 1st. But we thank the Lord for opening the door. Um, that door looked like it was shut pretty tight for quite a while. Pray for Burhanu and Wubit, if you would, and the continuing search for the EABM property. And then at the bottom, there are three, uh, three of our missionaries listed. Uh, the first one, Bill and Carrie, serve the Lord in a restricted access nation, as you can see. Um, please pray for them um, and the trial that they've been going through. Baptist International Outreach, um, we continue to pray that God would send missionaries uh, to the field through bio. And so keep that in prayer. Pray for all of these folks, uh, the Yinglings, the Peaches, the Childers that work over here at the office and keep the, keep the missionaries, uh, keep their work going. They do so much there. That's another thing we're going to be doing, by the way, in our global focus is we're going to talk about, uh, it's not really a focus so much on bio, but we're going to, I'm going to use one of these guys to just explain what they do for the missionary because they're a microcosm of what a lot of these missions agencies around the country are doing. We use, uh, we use between 16 and 20 different missions agencies and um, they all do the same thing. They work to make it possible for these missionaries to be on the field and um, I appreciate what they do but I want our church to have an in-depth, uh, an in-depth idea of what's going on over there and how they're helping missionaries. Um, so pray for them if you would at bio and then uh, Jody be about please continue to pray for her her husband went home to be with the Lord last fall after a, a couple years fighting or almost two years fighting ALS and we thank the Lord for Perry and Jody they've been longtime faithful servants with trans world radio and Jody is in the process of uh, she's in the process of uh, finding her place her, she has uh, full intent to continue with TWR and what she's doing now is how does God want her to serve? Her husband was the engineer. Uh, he did some fantastic work around the world in um, Africa, in Guam, um, as far and over in the uh, uh, someplace else in the Pacific. Um, he was the engineer. He was the brains behind that. And she's looking for her place of ministry now in TWR. And they are patiently working with her. And so I, I appreciate the way that uh, TWR is helping her, so please be in prayer for uh, Jody as she continues to uh, as she continues to get used to uh, uh, Perry being gone. Um, there are a couple I'd like you to add to the front, if you would. <clears throat> I talked with Sally Bolliard just a little bit before church tonight. Um, some of you know Sally; she sits right behind where Aileen and Barbara are sitting this evening. Um, Sally's son, Chad Bolliard, his last name is B-O-L-Y-A-R-D, Chad Bolliard, had knee replacement surgery four days ago in a Virginia hospital, and he's having some uh, rather serious complications, and he's developed numerous blood clots now in both of his lungs, and um, so she's driving right now. She's on her way to Virginia. It's about a seven-hour drive to try to get to the hospital. Um, Chad's had some heart issues in the past. He had his first heart attack, I think she said, when he was 32, and another one when he was 44. Um, and so let's pray for Chad, number one. And second, pray, pray for her as she's traveling tonight. Um, I don't know if she's by herself or not, um, but I told her tonight specifically we'd be praying for her. And then um, Brother Terry Childers handed me a card a moment ago. You remember Brother Doyle Ashburn? We prayed for, he pastors... Uh, Faith Baptist Church over in Pikeville, Tennessee, and he's dealt with prostate cancer, and he had all that. Um, he had to have gallbladder surgery um, today, and 
uh, when, when he had that surgery, another issue came up that caused a secondary surgery. And so please pre be in prayer for Doyle Ashburn, if you would. And, and Brother Terry also said his wife Janet is still recovering from her knee surgery. And so um, pray for them, pray for the Faith Baptist Church there in Pikeville, Tennessee, and I know they will, uh, they will appreciate your prayers. Um, there were some others on our, our list. Um, there were some other folks on our list that I wanted to mention tonight as well. Brother Charlie Jones asking us to pray for his uh, niece, his great niece, Jennifer, um, asking that she would be saved. She's expecting a baby on February 11th. Um, and then uh, Corey and Tiffany, um, the Linderman's asking us to pray for her. Tiffany's in the last stages of cancer and not sure, um, not sure how things are going to go there. The note is it doesn't look good, but if you'd pray for, uh, if you'd pray for uh, Tiffany. Um, I just remembered Sheila gave me all these notes and I forgot to give them to you as we were going over it. Um, Jean Ann Maxwell, this is a prayer request from the Martins. Uh, Jean Ann is on our prayer list already with cancer. They've found new tumors on her liver and so please pray for her. Uh, Brother Tom Davis did not get to see the oncologist yet. Uh, it was just a review of tests, but they didn't have the MRI. So he had a CT scan this past Monday. Now they're waiting for the Nashville doctor to call again. So some of you can relate to the hurry up and wait when it comes to these kinds of tests. Um, so please keep them in mind. Um, David Rutherford, still in the hospital, by the way. Uh, he is improving. And um, Doris said that he's, his oxygen is fine as long as he doesn't do anything. But if he does anything, his oxygen level plummets. And so there's a bit of frustration keeping him in the hospital there, but he's going to have to go to rehab when he's done just to get that worked back up. And so please pray, uh, pray, for, pray for them. Well, that's a lot of prayer requests. I want to share one more with you. And our church will be, we'll, we'll probably going to be sending a gift um, regarding this. For the last several years, we have been praying for uh, this little boy named Seth Mitchell. He's the grandson of our missionary in South Africa, Chris Radabaugh. Chris and Lucinda work with the deaf in Johannesburg, South Africa, and they've got a little five-year-old grandson who was born with um, terrible heart issues. Uh, I don't even know how many surgeries that little boy's had already. Um, they've got some things. So let me just read this letter, and I, I know I'm going a little long here tonight, but I want you to know what's going on, and we're going to try to have a part in this. It says, Dear Friends in Christ, thank you for your prayers for Seth. Since our last email, as reported in our previous regular email, Seth will be going to the U.S. for consultations with the cardiothoracic department at Washington University, St. Louis Children's Hospital. His appointment is on the 6th of April. Currently, as mom and dad are preparing for their trip to the U.S., we will be, we will be coming back for a few months of furlough at the same time. Seth has been doing well. However, the issue is the abnormally high pressure in the right ventricle of his heart. This excessive pressure will eventually cause heart failure. So as there is an urgency to get him to the United States soon. We praise the Lord that God has been answering prayers concerning his trip. Today, the U.S. consulate granted Jennifer's husband a visa to come to the U.S. to be with Seth and Jennifer. We ask that you pray that God will continue to guide and provide for them. This kind of move will be challenging for their family. Therefore, your prayers are greatly appreciated. Imagine selling everything you own here and coming to the U.S. with the clothes on your back, literally. Brandon, Jennifer's husband, is South African. And so as a result of that, he's not going to be able to work because of the restrictions on his visa. So Jennifer will have to work to provide for their family during this time. Seth has medical insurance here in South Africa. However, when he boards the plane, his insurance will not pay for any treatment in the U.S. Because of this, we have started a Give, Send, Go page for him. Please share this with your friends. We're trusting the Lord to provide for the initial consultation and tests. Once the doctor set a course, we'll know what the future amount needed for his care will be. And uh, then they give that web address. We appreciate that you have followed along with us for five years on the, on the path that God has planned for Seth. The Lord has used your prayers, encouragement, and love to help Brandon, Jennifer, Lucinda, and me as we've walked this path with him. 
We'll let you know when we arrive in the U.S. as we trust the Lord to provide for our needs. Um, and so we'll be sending a gift um, next week to help with that expense. Uh, they've, got a, they've got about a $15,000 challenge ahead of them just on the initial startup with this boy's examinations and tests. And so um, pray, if you would, for, uh, for this family. And I know they will be, I know they'll be appreciating uh, all of the prayers as we continue. We've watched, uh, we've watched Seth kind of grow. You'll remember the first pictures we showed of Seth. Uh, he was months old, and now he's five. And uh, he's got some of the same tendencies as any other five-year-old boy. So you can imagine a boy with heart problems, how hard it is maybe to keep him uh, where, where he needs to be. But pray for them. Pray for Brandon and Jennifer. Uh, also that God would continue to work in their hearts um, as well. And I know Chris and Lucinda will appreciate you doing that. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then here's what we're going to do. We're going to review, because it's been a couple of weeks. Let's review what we went through last time at the end of chapter 1. And then we'll, we'll hopefully finish up. I'm going to talk quickly tonight because I do not want this to become a three-part lesson. I would just assume it stay two-part. Um, and so I'm going to talk fast. If you will listen fast, everything will go perfectly fine. All right? Let's pray and ask God not only to watch over these folks that we've mentioned tonight, but also to profit us uh, with the ministry of his word through the Holy Spirit's work. Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for allowing us to be in your house, and even to be able to call you our Father is something that none of us could have earned, and certainly we don't deserve, but you shed your grace on us and called us to yourself and saved us and taken away sin and taken away its penalty so that now we can call you Abba Father, and we can come to you boldly, and we can ask you to give us grace to help in time of need, and we've read a few dozen names here tonight maybe of folks that need that grace. Some of them are facing very serious physical needs, Lord, very physical, and you know where they're at. Um, cancer, surgeries, treatments, unanswered questions, and your Holy Spirit's presence is going to make all the difference in the world for them as you give peace that passes understanding. So we pray that you would do that. We pray for those that are grieving the death of someone they love. Some of these have been shocks, Lord, and just caught us unaware. And then there are those who saw it coming. It really doesn't make it a whole lot easier. And so as these families are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, I pray that your Holy Spirit uh, would lead them and would comfort them and would make your very real presence felt in their hearts. And Lord, in these families where there's unsaved people, we pray that the, the prospect of their own death might be prompted to bring them to salvation. There sure are a lot of names on our prayer bulletin here, God, that, that we've mentioned for a long time, some of them, these folks that need to be saved. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would continue, even though you don't have to, we ask that you continue to convict them. You're so long-suffering, and we pray that you would continue, Lord, until they... Uh, soften their heart and stop rejecting you. Some of these folks we know, and they're just hard-hearted. And Lord, you don't owe them a thing, but we pray that your grace would continue uh, to knock on their heart's door so they'd be saved. I pray for these that are recovering from surgery and ask that your healing hand would be right in them and that you'd give them patience as they heal. Lord, we, we pray for this little boy, Seth, and his family, and ask that the financial uh, mountain that is looming in front of them would not discourage them from continuing to trust you. And I pray that people all over the world that know the Radabaws would help, and uh, that they would, uh, Lord, step up. We have awful good lives, and you give to us not only to provide for our needs and our family's needs, but you give to us so that uh, we can help other people bear the burdens that they have. So if we're able to do that, Lord, help us to do that. I thank you for the time we're going to have tonight in your word. I pray that you'd bless it to our hearts. Thank you for putting Habakkuk's little short story in here. And Lord, the prophecies are, they're daunting. When, when you're talking about destruction of a nation and, and using godless people to do it, it's just things we don't understand and Habakkuk didn't. And Lord, sometimes we have a hard time figuring out what you're doing or why you're doing certain things 
remind us, would you, God, that we're just finite creatures who can't see uh, but a speck of eternity. And you know the end, and you've designed the end from the beginning. So help us to cooperate with what you want to teach us tonight. And then, Lord, what you'd have us to do in this world that we live in until we see you face to face one day. Thank you for each family that's represented here this evening. I pray for our kids in the back and our student ministries and ask that in every room in the building where your word is being taught, that it would be used to accomplish your will in each of our hearts because we all stand in need of being made more like our Savior and less like ourselves. So help us to be willingly cooperate, uh, cooperative with you in all of that. Thank you again for your word. Thank you for making it understandable through our teacher, the Holy Spirit. Thank you for it being perfect so that even when we don't understand or we don't agree with it, we still know it's right. And so help us to come to it tonight um, with just that thought, that this is your good, holy word and that it is right for us. We pray in your name. Amen. Well, Habakkuk's a neat little book. It's, it's awful interesting to see how it parallels with our, uh, not just our country, but really our world right now. Last time when we started looking at this, uh, we mentioned that Habakkuk started the book out and he said, God, how long am I going to cry out to you to do something about Judah? These people are, they're rejecting you and, and I've cried out and cried out. We don't know how long, it almost sounds like it's been for years that he's cried out to God. And um, finally, God comes back, and he, he, gives, he gives Habakkuk an answer. Habakkuk had no idea was coming. I don't know if God has ever done that to you when you've prayed for something, and God answers, but it is certainly not what you were expecting. Habakkuk had no idea that God was going to say, you know what? I do notice what's going on with my people. I do notice their sin and their wickedness, and I'm going to use... This godless group of people over here, the Chaldeans or the Babylonians, I'm going to use them to chasten and judge my people. Habakkuk never saw that coming, and that threw him into a tailspin. He could not believe God was going to use the Babylonians for this. To him, you remember us mentioning this a couple weeks ago, to him the cure seemed worse than the disease. These were the Babylonians. But we talked about what was he going to do with what God had said? How, how would he respond? And we only made it through the first point last time, his initial response to God's answer, even though he didn't understand it, and this is so important for you and me, even though he didn't understand it, and what he did understand he didn't agree with, his first response was that he immediately worshipped the eternal holy God. He turned right to him. So this is, this is where Habakkuk is at. He turns to him first of all, and he comes to God in, in worship. And it's important when we don't understand and when we're upset and when we're grieving or when we're angry, it's important that we approach God the right way. And that's what Habakkuk is doing here. He'd been burdened for God's glory for a long time, and now he's looking at this, and this is not what he expected but he knows God. And so the God that he knows and what he knows about him, he's going to worship that God. Now, he doesn't understand what God is doing now, may not agree with what God is doing now, but what he knows about God leads him to, first of all, worship. So how does he respond to God's, how does he respond to God's uh, answer to his question? Well, the first thing he does is worship the eternal holy one. That takes us to the second thing. What's the second part of his response? Now we're getting into uh, the second part of verse number 12. We looked at, um, our, our text really is verse 12 of chapter 1 down to verse number 1 of chapter 2. This is where, uh, this is where he uh, responds to God. He asks the first question. God replies, verse 12 of chapter 1 down to chapter 2, verse 1. Then Habakkuk replies back to God. Chapter 2 and verse 2, God talks back to Habakkuk. You can watch this conversation go back and forth. So the first response that Habakkuk had was to worship God. The second one that we come to tonight, it's that the prophet boldly challenged the Lord. First he worshipped him. But then all of a sudden, I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to sound disrespectful, but all of a sudden he bows up. 
and he challenges God. He goes from worshiping him to challenging him. Remember, what the name of our series is called The Puzzled Prophet. He does not understand what's going on. I am so glad that God put this in here because it encourages me that a prophet who got to hear the audible voice of God didn't always understand what God was doing. That helps me when I don't understand what God is doing. And the perplexity of, of, of our puzzled prophet here in verse 12, the beginning of verse 12, he's saying this, God, you're eternal and you're holy. How can you use these godless Babylonians against us like this? How, how does your holiness let this happen? What is he doing here? He's reminding God of his utter perfection. Habakkuk reminded the Lord of his utter perfection. Look at verse number 13. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. Wherefore lookest thou upon them that deal treacherously, and holdest thy tongue when the number or when the wicked devour the man that is more righteous than he? God, you're perfect. You can't look on sin. How can you use these Babylonians? The cure is worse than the disease. There's a man by the name of Walter Chantry. For 39 years, he pastored uh, the Grace Baptist Church up in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. And then he went from, from pastoring to editing a magazine called The Banner of Truth. It's a wonderful magazine. In April 2007, he wrote a, a, an article on uh, the book of Habakkuk, or part of the book of Habakkuk, I should say. And in that article, he wrote this. How can God see and hold his tongue when the evil devour those more righteous than they? At this point, the grappler, Habakkuk, is taking hold of God's holiness to argue against the Lord's plan to use the defiled Babylonian army to ravage Judah. It seemed to Habakkuk that God's tolerance of Babylon was inconsistent with his holiness. Would you mark that sentence? It seemed to Habakkuk that God's tolerance of Babylon was inconsistent with his holiness. And, and then Pastor Chantry goes on to write, The Lord was allowing the more wicked to swallow up the lesser. Where is God's holiness in such, in, in such an action? How could God keep quiet as Nebuchadnezzar swallowed Jerusalem and marched righteous Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Ezekiel off into exile? That's a good question, and that's Habakkuk's question. You ever look around today and say, God, how, how is it that the wicked are prospering like this? That is an ages-old question. That question has not just been asked for decades or centuries. It has been asked for millennia. Here's a prophet over 2,500 years ago asking this question, God, how, do you, how can you do this? And then as if, now remember, he's challenging God. God has said, I'm going to bring the Babylonians in to, des to destroy and to punish Judah. And, and Habakkuk is saying, God, how can you do that? That's what he's saying in verse number 13. Now, in verses 14 through 17, Habakkuk poetically describes the holocaust that Judah is about to endure. God has shown him what's coming. A lot of times we think the Jews have been through a holocaust only one time in their history and that that happened uh, in the late 30s and early 40s of the last century, and that's incorrect. World War II is not the only holocaust the Jewish nation has been in. The Assyrians put them through a holocaust. The Romans put them through a holocaust. The Babylonians here are about to put them through a holocaust. God's chosen people have been persecuted for thousands of years and, on ter and in terrible ways. I'll just pause right here and say, I don't know what our nation's going to do, but Christian, you and I ought to always stand in support of Israel. Amen. You do that because regardless of what the government says and regardless of what contemporary, uh, contemporary uh, wisdom might say, God said, I'll bless you if you'll bless my people. 
But if you don't, you better duck. You remember God saying this? I'll bless those that bless you, Abraham. I'll curse those that curse you. Pay attention when our national leaders and our people on, on certain television shows start, start taking pots, pot shots at the Jew. Pay attention. You've, we've got Congress. We, we've got people in the U.S. House of Representatives and the U.S. Senate that are not so covertly trying to cause a division between the United States and Israel. Better be careful. We're only inviting further judgment if we do that. That's all we're doing. All right, that's enough. Habakkuk, verse number 14. What does he say? God, you're too holy. Verse 13, you're too holy to look on this. How can you be quiet when, when Babylon's going to come in? Verse 14, and makest, he's still asking a question, and makest men as the fishes of the sea, as the creeping things that have no ruler over them. They take up, I said he's poetically describing this. Okay, verse 14 is describing the people of Judah. Verse 15 and following, he's talking about the Babylonians. He says in verse 14, we are like helpless fish in the ocean that have nobody watching out for us. And verse 15, they, the Babylonians, take up all of them with the angle and they catch them in their net and gather them in their drag. Therefore, they rejoice and are glad. Therefore they sacrifice unto their net and burn incense unto their drag because by them their portion is fat and their meat plenteous. Shall they therefore empty their net to not spare continually to slay the nations? Do you remember what we said last week? He's talking about fishing. There were three ways that they fished back that way. We still use basically those same things today. The angle is an old King James word for the hook. And then there's the drag net. And then there's the casting net. The drag net, you see that story in the New Testament where Jesus talked about the boats that were dragging in these fish and two boats started to sink. What they would do is they'd tie one end of the net to this boat, one end of the net to this boat. They'd drop that thing and then they'd row and they'd, connect, they'd catch all these fish together. That's the drag net. And then there's the net they would throw out there that had weights all the way around its edges. And so when it gets out there, it drops and it collapses at the bottom. And they pull that in, that casting net in. And then they also fish with the hook. And he's saying, we, Judah, are the helpless fish. The Babylonian are those terrible fishermen. And they're killing us. And here's what Habakkuk, did you know what Habakkuk says in verse, in verse number 14? They have no ruler over them. Lord, there's nobody spiritually directing. They're not listening to me. They're not listening to anybody that's preaching right now. It was, it's an absolute mess, and he describes their prosperity. You like the end of that verse? Their portion is fat, and their meat is plenteous. Lord, they're getting fat on us. He's describing this judgment that has been, that has been taken. You know what's interesting? Ancient Babylonian art that's been discovered through archaeological digs show the, uh, they depict this captivity. They depict the Babylonian captivity of Judah as they're being led away. Do you know what the picture shows? It shows a bunch of Jews being marched in a line, and each Jew is connected to the one in front of him by a fish hook through their lower lip. Just a line of people connected by a hook through their lower lip. That's exactly what Habakkuk prophesied here. And the Babylonians depicting this battle showed fish hooks through their feet. This is exactly what was going on. And, and, and Habakkuk is challenging them here. Can I say it like this? He's arguing with God. He's arguing with God. That's not very comfortable, is it? Have you ever caught yourself doing that? My mom, she's in heaven now, but... When, um, when my first sister died, uh, she was killed in a car accident, I, I had a lot of discussions with mom and dad, mostly mom, and she said, you know, I know you're not supposed to ask God why. And I said, Mom, I, I said, I don't know where people get that. I said, if you read the scripture, Old or New Testament, there's an awful lot of questions being asked toward God that begin with why. Well, that's what he's doing here. He's asking, why are you allowing this to happen? How are you allowing this to happen? We don't like to argue with God. 
I put that question on your worksheet. Why are we uncomfortable arguing with God? You know why? Because deep down, we know that he is right every time. That's why. No matter what argument I put up against him, I know in my heart, and you know in your heart, what he's doing is right and what he's doing is good. But I want you to know, Habakkuk's not in the wrong here. Habakkuk's not at all in the wrong. He, um, he's going, uh, challenging God, boldly challenging God. But we don't like to do that, oftentimes because we know that he's right all of the time. Why is that? Because he knows more than we do. He sees more than we do. He sees the very end of every situation you're facing. You're facing a situation now individually or as a family or we face it as a church and we don't know the end of that. God knows it. He already knows it. He takes into consideration those things that we could never know. Now, having said all that, he still invites you to come boldly into his presence with your prayer. Knowing that we don't know what he knows. Abraham pled with God. Do you remember that? God's going to destroy Sodom where his nephew Lot lived, and Abraham gets into that debate with God. God, if, if there's 50 people there, are you still going to kill them? And God says no. And then it dawns on him, there's not 50 people, righteous people living in Sodom. He says, what about 45? Yeah, I'll, I'll spare him for 45. What about 40, 30, 20, 10? That whole time, God is patient with Abraham. Do you know why God allowed that back and forth? Because he knew Abraham's heart. He was not questioning the goodness of God. He was arguing from a heart of compassion. Now, when you and I pray and we boldly challenge God, do it from a heart of compassion and not one that challenges God on his goodness. God is always good. God is always right. But you can go boldly to the throne of your father and that's, what's, that's exactly what's happening here. Um, if I didn't put it on your worksheet, write down Matthew 23, verses 37 and 38. Jesus, looking over the city of Jerusalem, crying, because he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how, how often would I have gathered you under my wings as a, a hen gathereth her chicks and protected you, but you would have nothing to do with me. And Jesus, knowing the destruction that was coming in 70 AD, wept, over Jerusalem. He knew that was going to happen, but he still wept over Jerusalem. Here's Habakkuk, and he knew that God was going to destroy Babylon, but he's asking him not to. Let Jesus weep for Jerusalem. Let Habakkuk weep for Judah. And let us weep for our nation. But I'll tell you, Judgment is coming to this country. It's coming. But the fact that predestinated uh, judgment is coming is no basis for indifference. We ought to cry out for them. The Bible doesn't tell us to hide our feelings. Do you ever go to, let me ask you a question. You better answer this internally and not externally. But do you ever go to God in prayer and try to hide your feelings from God? You ever go to God with something looming huge in front of you and you just show up and make small talk in your prayer closet? I'm not going to bring that up. You're, you're smiling and you're shaking your heads. That's a silly thought before an omniscient God. God knows the very thoughts of my heart. In fact, he knows them better than I do. And there's no place in Scripture that God says we ought to hide our feelings. In fact, in Scripture, it's just the opposite. These people are pouring their hearts out to God. That's what Habakkuk is doing here. What is it that motivated Habakkuk's argument with God, this challenge to God? What is it that's motivating him and these petitions that he's making? God, they're going to kill us like fishermen kill fish. Two things motivated his argument. First, Personal integrity. 
Remember I said that God accepted Abraham's dickering back and forth because he knew Abraham's heart. It was right toward God. He wasn't challenging God's goodness. The second thing is his love, Habakkuk's love for the people of Judah. He loved Judah. What motivates this challenge that he, he brings toward God? Personal integrity and love for people. So skip the small talk. That's foolish when you go to God. Skip the small talk and get right to it. That's exactly what Habakkuk did, isn't it? Now, God, you're too holy to look on this. How can you look on the, the wickedness of Babylon? They're going to come and they're going to, we're going to be like helpless fish and they're going to hook us and they're going to net us and they're going to drag us and they're going to kick us off. He is so bold. And there's other places that are like this. Uh, other examples, Moses to God. You know, when, uh, when the Lord spoke of, uh, when the Lord spoke of uh, destroying Israel, he was fed up with their whining and their complaining, and he, God just got tired of it. And Numbers chapter 14, verse number 11, the Lord said to Moses, How long will this people provoke me? How long will it be? Ere they believe me for all the signs which I have showed among them. I will smite them with a pestilence and disinherit them. And will, and he's talking to Moses. I will make of thee a greater nation and mightier than they. This was Moses' opportunity to say, all right, I'm tired of them too, God. There are a bunch of whiners. They're driving me crazy out here. This was Moses' opportunity to go right along with what God said. Wipe them out. Let's start over. Verse 13 of Numbers 14, Moses said unto the Lord, the Egyptians will hear about that. Isn't that something? Moses said unto the Lord, then the Egyptians shall hear it. For thou broughtest up this people in thy might from among them. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land. For they have heard that thou, Lord, are among this people that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud standeth over them, and that thou goest before them by daytime a pillar of a cloud, and in, uh, in a pillar of fire by night. Isn't that interesting? He goes on and says, Now if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he sware unto them, therefore he hath slain them in the wilderness. I love that Moses said, God, your enemies will hear about this, and they'll attack your name if you do this. And God allowed that. Moses was challenging God. Habakkuk is challenging God. David does the same thing. Psalm chapter 10 and verse number 1. Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? Jeremiah chapter 14, verse number 8. O the hope of Israel, the Savior thereof in time of trouble, why shouldest thou be a stranger in this land and as a wayfaring man that turnest aside to tarry for the night? Moses, Habakkuk, David, Jeremiah, all of them saying, God, how can you operate like this, challenging the Lord? I want to point something out to you, and that's this. These arguments that are made by Habakkuk and David and Moses and Jeremiah, these arguments are in your Bible because the Holy Spirit wanted those examples read by you and me. It wasn't David's idea to put that in scripture or Habakkuk's idea. It was the Holy Spirit that did that. I think you and I can learn from Habakkuk and Moses and David and Jeremiah. And we need to be faithful in the passion that we pray with. Don't make small talk with God. When you pray, you are in the presence of of the king of the universe who knows everything, can do anything, challenge. He boldly challenged him. Do you have that kind of passion in your prayer life? There's a learning point here and we'll go on, but you need to ask yourself this. Is that kind of passion present in my life? Or when I pray, am I making small talk? with the omnipotent king. Habakkuk cut right to the chase. 
He worshiped God because his heart was right. But the integrity of his heart and the love he had for the people of Judah challenged, or caused him to challenge God. So we need to pray like they prayed. Don't try to hide your feelings from God. No small talk. Get to it. <coughs> this is on your worksheet. We are to be honest with God when we pray. We are to be honest with God when we pray. But through the beginning of his prayer, Habakkuk also shows us that we are to be honest about God. Sometimes it's good for us, and I use the word remind implying that God forgot, but there's no other better word for it. Sometimes in our prayer, we ought to remind God how good he is and how holy he is and how just he is. That's what Habakkuk is doing, and David does it all through the Psalms. Brother John's been walking us through. If you follow John's Facebook, he's walked us through the book of Psalms. All through the book of Psalms, David is reminding God of who he is. That's a good pattern for us. We ought to watch that. The Bible reveals, uh, you're not going to agree with this statement, but here we go. The Bible reveals God is merciful and kind, omnipotent, omniscient, and faithful. He is so committed to the good of his people that he is incapable of allowing anything harmful to befall them that is not ultimately beneficial for them. God is so committed to the good of his people that he is incapable of allowing anything harmful to befall them that is not ultimately beneficial to them. That's how much God loves you. He's not content to leave you when you wander away. You're saying, boy, that doesn't sound like, a, like it's going to be good for Judah for the Babylonians to come in. It's going to be good for them. It's just not going to be enjoyable. But it is going to be good for them. God's drawing them back to himself. So there's Habakkuk. He's facing this terrible disaster. What does he do? First, he worships God. But then he told God exactly how the situation looked like to him. God, this is how it looks to me. And just like us... Habakkuk was this finite creature, limited in his understanding, did not see the end from the beginning, didn't know all that, and he, like us, never saw, God, never saw things exactly the way God did. We don't see things the way God does. Even when we think we see things the way God does, we don't see the depth of it. Because you and I never have full comprehension of any given circumstance. The reason is we can't. We can't know how far the ripple effect goes. We think this certain circumstance is right here in front of us. But this circumstance that we see right here, God has ripple effects going out. That's why God told Habakkuk at the very beginning, Habakkuk, you're looking in the wrong place. You're focusing on, you're focusing on Judah. I'm working outside of the boundaries of Judah and coming in. Things truly are the way God sees them, not the way we see them. Things truly are the way God sees them, not the way we see them. There's a popular phrase that goes around and it says this. Perception is reality. You ever heard that? Perception is reality. Can I tell you something? That's not true. That is not true. There was not one person listening to Noah preach when he's building a boat out in the middle of nowhere. There's not one person that perceived God was going to send a global flood to wipe out the earth. Their perception was as far away from reality as it can be. Don't buy into that. Perception is not reality. The way God sees things, that's reality. You know what biblical wisdom is? Seeing things from God's point of view. You want to be wise? See things the way God does. Habakkuk's working on it. It's just not happening as quickly as it needs to for him. He's not seeing all this, but this is true. Remind yourself that God is still who he says he is, not the way a horrible situation presents God to be. He stands back and he looks at the Babylonians coming in, and his initial response is, God, I just don't know if you're, you're too holy to let this happen. 
Remember that God is still who he says he is, not the way a horrible invasion by the Babylonian army seems to say he is. There was something a lot bigger in the works here than just Babylon getting more land and getting more slaves. God was doing a far bigger work than that. It's humbling, but it's true. We do want the truth, but at times we wish, we wish the truth were different. Habakkuk wanted the truth. He's a prophet of God. He's a faithful prophet of God. He wants the truth, but at times we wish it were different. Judgment is coming to this world just as God has decreed it's coming. It should break our hearts. We can boldly challenge the Lord with the right prayer and with the right heart. That's how we ought to respond, just like he is. Babylonians are coming. Judgment is coming to this country, to this world. Personally, I think you're seeing that in the coronavirus that's worldwide. I think this is a biblical pestilence, and it has biblical causes. I, I think there's a motive behind this. I'm not saying it didn't come out of this country or that country. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying when you read the word pestilence in the scripture, this is what it looks like. It's not an outbreak of the flu. That's not a pestilence. That's a seasonal illness that comes around. This is a pestilence. And I'll tell you, it's my personal opinion, this is just the beginning. Right. Scripture's careful to point out it's going to get worse and worse. I was talking with Sheila today, though. We were talking about the, the progression of time, and it's going to get worse. Do not let it steal your joy. The greatest book to reveal the joy of the Apostle Paul was written from a jail cell. Amen. Don't let it steal your joy. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard for you, for your family, for the world. But Christians ought to be joyful at all times. Habakkuk looks at this thing. He listens to God's reply. God, when are you going to do something? God says, I am going to do something. I'm sending the Babylonians. He worshiped first. Second, he boldly challenged the Lord. Third, the prophet said, I'm going to stand at my watch. Look at chapter 2 and verse 1. He says all these things. He says it about Judah. We're helpless fish. About the Babylonians. They're going to catch us. They're going to drag us away with hooks. And then he says, I'm going to shut up and listen now. That's what he says. Chapter 2, verse 1, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. I, I like the way he says that, don't you? He's wondering, you ever been there? He's wondering if, if he stepped out of line talking to God the way he just talked to him. I think I'm about to get reproved. I'm going I'm to stop talking. I'm going to go sit over here and just see what happens when I am, what am I going to say when he reproves me? Let's get into this last point real quick. He's challenged God here. He's nailed his complaint to the mercy seat, if you will. Now he says, I'm going to go to my tower. James Phillips in his daily Bible readings talks about that tower. He says, this refers to the ancient practice of ascending to a high place like a watchtower in order to secure an extensive view. The watchman can see from his vantage point the approach of an enemy, a messenger bringing news from the front, or an army commander can obtain a bird's eye view of the deployment of his forces. The point here is that when you, when you view any situation from, advantage, from a vantage point, you gain perspective. This is what you want. You want to be able to see your life from God's frame of reference. How does God see your life? You want a vantage point that will let you do that. How can you and I know how God sees our life? By knowing what God says in his word. He tells us how he sees us. This is your and my source of wisdom. So you want this vantage point, this tower to gain perspective. We get too close to the situation the closer you get to a wall, the less you can see of the wall. So you want a place where you can see better. I, I've got to move quickly, so I might be skipping some things. You build a watchtower for yourself by knowing the Bible. 
You build a watchtower by knowing the history and the doctrines of the New Testament church. But above all, you stand at your watch by going into the presence of God and pouring your heart out to him just like Habakkuk did. What God was doing and where God was bringing his answer from did not make sense to him. And he went right to God's presence and talked things over with the one that the Bible calls the wonderful counselor. God, I need some counsel on this because I don't agree. I don't know what you're doing. And what I do know, I don't, I don't agree with. You need a tower, and I need a tower. We need a place that we can go where we can see from a good vantage point what it is that God is doing. That's in the presence of God. This kind of takes us back to where we started when we talked about uh, that the, the importance of, of having a right approach to God, having a, a viewpoint from which to see what God is doing. He said, I'm going to... I'm going to stand my watch, I'm going to set up on the tower, and we'll watch to see what he will say to me. I've spoke my piece, now what is God going to do? You need a watchtower. Do you have a watchtower? Do you have a place that's above the noise of the world where you can come apart? We had a little, I think it was supposed to be a breakfast nook in our house, but it's not very big for a breakfast nook, it's just a little bay window area, except it's just, let me just say it like this, it's just enough for a rocking chair and a table and a lamp to fit in that little nook, and that's Terry's cubby hole. That's her place to go for her morning devotions, for her prayer time, for her Bible study time, that's where she goes. I don't find her reading her Bible or praying anywhere else in the house other than that little place. That is her tower. She's got that place. You and I need a place as believers that we can come back and get away from the noise of the world, the news of the world, and isolate ourselves with God for a little bit. That's where we're going to gain his perspective. Habakkuk uh, presents these complaints to God, and, and then God responds, and I want to give you three, quickly, I want to give you three conclusions that I hope are comforting. I hope they're comforting to you. Sometimes you're going to go to God, and you're going to come out of that prayer time, and you're going to think, well, I just better wait till God replies because I probably crossed the line in that prayer because that's exactly what Habakkuk's saying. I'm going to go and wait for when I am reproved. Here's three conclusions. Number one, standing at our watch makes us courageous. It makes us courageous. Do you know why Habakkuk was bold like he was with God right here? It's because he was a prophet of God. He was doing what God had given him to do. And walking in obedience gives us courage. He was standing his watch. He loved the people. He loved God. You and I are called to be strong in the Lord in this evil day. So the first thing it does, it makes us courageous. You're not going to fear the chariots of the Babylonians. You're not, going to, uh, you're not going to quake before scientists and doctors. Stand your watch. Do what God has given you to do. It'll make you courageous. I put under here, no calamity changes God's love for his people. Just because God was sending the Babylonians didn't mean he hated them. And that was something that Habakkuk knew about God. He knew God was good, and he knew God loved the people. Let me ask you a question tonight. What if the U.S. faced an invasion like, like Judah was facing by a superior force like that? What if this whole mess over there with Russia and Ukraine and all that, let's just say crazy Putin decides to go nuclear. What if he does? What if he goes nuclear and it's not just Ukraine he just loses it what do you do then Romans eight thirty nine. none of those things shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord there is nothing in this world 
that God designs or allows, there's nothing in this world that's going to separate us from his love. And Habakkuk knows this, so he's courageous. Those things have no power or influence whatsoever. A nuclear bomb has no influence over the love of God on you. A nuclear bomb does not affect your eternity. If you know that going into a fight, don't you think that would make you courageous? Here, this is where Habakkuk is living. This is why he's, he's bold like he is because he knows he's talking to a God who's going to work all things together for good to them that love him. He knows this. It, it gives him courage. Standing our watch. I have to skip some stuff here. Read Ephesians 1.11. We serve a God who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. That means at any given point in the entire universe, God's in charge. He's doing his will. So, standing our watch in his presence makes us courageous. Standing our watch in his presence gives us hope. Gives us hope. You know what? The Babylonians couldn't do one thing on their own. They couldn't breathe by themselves if it weren't for God's, God's air. They couldn't do one thing by themselves. If the Babylonians can't do anything by themselves, how much, how much more true is that for those of us who love to be in God's hand? The Babylonians, they didn't care one thing about Jehovah, yet he had them doing his will. Those of us who love the Lord, we're in cooperation with what he's doing. That should give us hope. We may grieve over things that he does, but he's going to do them, and he's doing them for his glory, for our good, all the time. We do not know, whatever the situation you want to apply here, whatever situation, we do not know what awaits us in the coming days. We don't. But we do know that there is a divine appointment that God has made for us. It's appointed unto men once to die. After this, the judgment. And the book of Revelation shows us that a terrible judgment day is coming for the earth. The world and its treasures and everything it values, the Bible says, is going to melt away. That's very descriptive. Stars falling from the heavens. I don't even know what that looks like. What happens if our sun... If it just drops, and there's no cords hanging it there anyways, somebody's holding that sun right where it's at, and because it's doing what it's doing, the earth does what it does. If stars start falling from the heaven, what's going to happen? That's coming according to scripture. But the Christian has hope. Why? Because God is from everlasting to everlasting. Remember, isn't that how Habakkuk started this book? Art thou not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. Standing your watch, being faithful, being obedient, doing those things God's given us to do, just day in, day out faithfulness. It gives us courage. It gives us hope. God's people are not to live in fear, but in hope. We are secure in Christ. You can't fall away from that. Once saved, always saved saved. Keep that and don't let anyone talk you out of that. Secure in Christ. I I love reading at at every graveside I I go to, especially those of a believer. 1 Thessalonians 4 verses 13 through 18 and what confidence Paul has. Let me emphasize words in a very familiar passage of scripture for you. The day will come, 1 Thessalonians 4 13, The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to be with the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Paul was emphatic about this. It gives us courage to stand our watch. It gives us hope to stand our watch. Last thing is this, standing our watch is the most practical place for you to be. Standing your watch is the most practical place for you to be. When a Christian stands at their watch and does their duty, they usually do not rush into folly. They usually don't rush into folly. 
Station yourself on the tower. Wait and see what God will say to your complaints and, and to your challenge. Wait with the right heart. If you'll wait, if you'll stand and wait on him, you'll probably not rush into folly. When people are scared, they tend to react instead of respond. When people are frightened, they act in haste. And acting in haste, I don't know about you, acting in haste has usually not ended up well with me. Wait, I say, on the Lord. No wonder David put that in there more than one time in the book of Psalms. Standing at our watch is the most practical place for us to be. Haste often leads to panic. Habakkuk said, I'm not going to have any of that. I will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I'm reproved. People may ask you what you're going to do in the future. When are you going to retire? I'm 55 years old and people ask me all the time, when are you going to retire? Like, I'm not even old enough for, I don't even spell retirement yet. What are you going to do? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. And this ought to be your question. It doesn't matter if you're 55 or 85. This is what you ought to do. I'm going to wait and see what God wants me to do. I'm going to stand my watch. I'm going to wait and see what the Lord will say unto me. What, what are you going to do? Where are you going to go when you retire? We'll see what God says. What are you going to do next week? I'm going to see what God says. Let God direct your steps. I will watch to see what he will say to me. What am I saying? I'm saying the very best presence of mind flows from standing at your watch for God and waiting to receive his direction, his command. Let him guide your life. The answer takes time, but it's worth the wait. Standing at your watch, Christian, is the most practical place for you to be. I remember Junior Hill. Junior Hill was an evangelist we used to hear down in Jacksonville. Remember him, Brother West? He's a big old boy. Um, Junior Hill was a, he's a big old evangelist. And uh, and he's a big guy. He said to his wife one time, he said, you see my belt around the house? And she said, it goes all the way around the house now? He... (laughs) He was, he's a big guy. I heard, uh, I heard Junior Hill one time describe uh, the Christian being discouraged as we stand our watch. And he described it like this, that in World War I, there's an American soldier dug into a trench over in Germany, and, and they're uh, standing in the trenches, and before him was this miles-long line of forest. And... And he was overwhelmed because as he looked to his left, he could not see the end of the forest. And he looked to the right, he could not see the end of the forest. And and an enemy soldier could have been in any one of those thousands and thousands of trees out there. And this young American soldier was just getting overwhelmed with that thought. And Junior Hill went on to say that this, this young man's wise sergeant came up to him. And he put a stick in the ground right here. And then three feet over here, he put another stick in the ground on the top of that trench. And he said, young man, you're not responsible for that whole thing. You're responsible for that area, that three feet right there. He said, all you got to do is watch that three feet right there. You stand and you watch right here. And Christian, your responsibility, my responsibility is not to know the end from the beginning. God just wants you to stand your watch. And I need to stand my watch. And I do that until he leads. And I do that until he speaks. And I do that until he comes. It's good to challenge God. and It's good to pray boldly and courageously. But the most practical place you can be is to just stand the watch that God has given you. Let me read this from James Montgomery Boyce's book on the minor prophets. He said, Habakkuk has gone as far as his reasoning can take him. Now he needs to know more if he's to make progress, so he waits for that instruction. He says that he's going to wait and see what God will say to him. This is worth looking at in detail, for it answers the question, how does one leave a problem with God? This whole conversation is because Habakkuk has a problem with God. How do you leave a problem with God? Three steps, and then we're done. First, detach yourself from that problem. 
Detach yourself from it. For Habakkuk, that was going to the tower. You got to detach yourself from the problem. From the problem, you, you get too close to the wall, you can't see the whole wall. So, so step back. Martin Lloyd Jones says it's one of the most important principles in the psychology of the Christian life. But then he adds that it's often precisely where we go astray. We go on our knees. This is Lloyd Jones talking, not me. We go on our knees and tell God about the thing that is worrying us. We tell him we cannot solve the difficulty ourselves, that we cannot understand, and we ask him to deal with it to show us his way. Then the moment we get up from our knees, we begin to worry about that very same problem again. Detach yourself from it. Second, expect God's answer. Expect God's answer. He's your loving Heavenly Father. He's not waiting to to persecute you. He's waiting to shower you with love. Just because we leave something with God and we stop worrying about it doesn't mean we forget about it entirely. Habakkuk's image there of the the watchtower is helpful because the, the watchtower detaches him from what's going on below. It detaches him from that. How are we to watch for God's answer? He said, I will I will stand upon my watch. We watch for God's answer primarily through the word of God. But you also get it through the leading of the Holy Spirit. Through opened and closed doors. Through biblical counsel. But primarily you get his answer through his word. And then the last one. I really have to hurry. You've you've been very patient. Second one is expect God to answer. The third one is just this. Be persistent in your expectation. That answer may not come quickly. He says, I will watch to see what he will say to me. Not if God answers, when God answers. He is fully expecting God to answer him. He just doesn't know when. Can I tell you this? Chapter 2 and verse 1, Habakkuk closes his mouth. He says, I'm just going to wait and see if God answers. And if you're, ask, if you're asking yourself tonight... Does God answer? He does. The entire second chapter of the book of Habakkuk is God's reply to his questions here. You, just, you and I just have to wait for it. So there's what Habakkuk did. First he worshiped God. Then he challenged. Then he challenged God. I, I want to encourage you that God's answers are not always going to be what you want to get. But they're always going to be right. They're always going to be good. All you and I, all we have to do is just stand our watch. Not that whole, not that whole line. You got your 36 inches. You stand your watch. God will prove himself faithful to you. Lord, thank you for Habakkuk. We share in his frustration and we we share in his questions and he, he perplexes over these things. God, he just doesn't, he doesn't understand what you're doing why you're allowing things you allow. And we live there sometimes. Lord, that is us. It's me. So help me to have his wisdom and to leave it with you and to pray with you and then, Lord, just to go to my tower and watch and see what you will say to me when I'm reproved and teach me and give me a teachable heart to learn. And I pray, God, that as we delve further into Habakkuk's little book, that you would help us to grow in courage and grow in faith And grow in the knowledge of your word. So when these days come, and they are coming, Lord, when they come, we respond correctly as your children. We pray in your name. Amen. God bless you, church. It's good to see you tonight.